now we are moving to uh, the second presentation by Jojo Fung, Veronica Sarasvati, and Bernard Lee, who will be talking about an appraisal of the Belt and Road Initiative in the light of integral ecology with the focus on Indonesia and Africa. We would like to invite now Father Jojo Fung from Loyola School of Theology, Manila, uh, Veronica Sarasvati from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Jakarta, Indonesia, and Bernard Lee, who holds a PhD from Oxford University. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, my name is um, um, Bernard Lee. <clears throat> And today I'm going to present a case about um, uh, the collaboration um, well, between China and um, Ethiopia. Um, to start off, in the past, uh, there are so many opportunities for China to collaborate with African countries. Um, basically, there are 10 big projects, um, namely for the China and Africa collaboration opportunities in the past. Yeah, there are big, 10 big projects, i.e. the China, Africa, um, agricultural modernization collaboration project, second um, China Africa infrastructure collaboration project, and thirdly China Africa green development collaboration project. Also have China Africa collaboration for reducing poverty project, and also about um, China Africa public health collaboration project. Just to name a few. Particularly today, I'm going to talk a little bit, you know, evidence about the. Uh, collaboration or cooperation between two countries, China and Ethiopia, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. First of all, the initiative of green energy development in Ethiopia is a big issue. Green energy here, we mean the solar, wind, hydro energy. Um, under the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, China has invested a total, or more than that, yeah, um, investment in energy development in Ethiopia, more than 280 million US dollars. And it definitely benefits Ethiopia and Kenya. And for another project, um, well, I mean, a report yeah, um, <clears throat> created by China Africa Research Initiative School of Advanced International Studies and John Hopkins University, is that that, um, well, the impact of Hydro China, a China energy company's participation in Ethiopia, um, they have great impact in this green energy development in Ethiopia. They have collaboration regarding the energy um, uh, project. For example, they have a project in the place called the Adama Wind Farm. Um, Regarding this project, um, they set the standards yeah, in three ways, in three aspects. One is about the technology transfer. The second one is about job creation and also about environmental and social impact. In terms of the state of the art technology transfer and knowledge to local professionals, Hydro China, oh, the Chinese, you know, China based company has outperformed it. It's some um, Western counterpart, WorkNet. Correct me if I'm wrong, we get this French company, a comparison-sized French energy company that has engaged in another similar energy project in Ethiopia. For the Bell and Road Initiative, the major objective is to seek win-win. Win-win means collaboration between two countries. And they're seeking that, you know, this kind of mutual interest. First of all, regarding the sustainable impact. We're going to see project. Adamar Wind Farm Collaboration Project. China Ethiopia cooperation well, has you know, sustainable and social impact on Ethiopia. As I said, you know, they have um, increased the job opportunities, particularly for local farmers and engineers, and building a lot of roads and water pumps and benefited the whole local community. This is about the strength of Chinese companies. And a lot of time, you know, for Western companies or countries, they do not recognize the fact that China has already, you know, done a lot of these kinds of infrastructure um, establishment. Another issue, sustainable infrastructure in Ethiopia. Since 2010, 
through BRI. China has invested a total of more than 30% of Ethiopia's GDP in building infrastructure, Deloitte 2016. And in 2016 and 2021, Ethiopia's GDP is about 74.3 billion US dollars and 111 billion US dollars, respectively, according to Trading Economics 2022. That's a port in um, Ethiopia and China has invested a lot of you know um money in this port. Um, I don't know if it's correct or not, it's the devotees of ports. Ethiopia has directly benefited from the speedy expansion of its dynamic networks, including energy and power and transport. Well, transport among all those countries in East Asia, East Africa. Ethiopia has received the most investment from China, more than 12 billion US dollars from year 2000 to 2014. Again, regarding the achievement, Ethiopia's GDP increased by some 50% from 2016 to 2021. And Ethiopia has experienced you know, tremendous growth in this national wealth, according to you know, uh, different scholars, yeah. for example, Wire and mode 2018. And also, according to National Geographic 2022, in contrast, colonization here, well, it means European. Colonization's impacts include environmental degradation and the spread of disease, economic instability, ethnic rivalries, and human rights violations starting in the 19. Eight, well, 1880s, 1880s, European nations focus on taking over African lands, and that's about the bad, you know, things in the past. But then we focus in the future. However, tremendous sustainable and successful China-Ethiopia cooperation has played an exemplary role in China-Africa cooperation. What's the implication in the future? Now, under BRI, I think we learn a lot yeah, from this kinds of infrastructure investment. The results shows us that uh, there is a big increase in cropland and forest areas. I mean, the useful land. But there's a decline in grassland and shrubland, which is about, uh, you know, this kind of wasteland, okay, useless land between year 2003 and year 2013. The aggregated ESV ecosystem services of value of the area in the study has grown from 75 million US dollars in 20 year 2003 to 82 million US dollars in year 2013. And we suggest that the policymakers um, of the cooperation need to consider this ESV as a criteria in the future for land use policy planning. And that, that's about my part here yeah, to share. Let's go to the, uh, the C section. This section, yeah. I just want to like use the lens of the Catholic social teaching in the church as enunciated in Laudato C si and Fratelli Tutti, yeah? because I think we do need this kind of perspective no? uh, from integral ecology. Um, in number 116, I think, you know, there is a certain critique. No? Socialist capitalism in China needs to ensure that all lives are all prior to the appropriation of goods by a few. This can happen in any country and no less China, especially you know, with the modernization of China. It also means combating the structural causes of poverty, inequality, the lack of work, land and housing, the denial of social and labor, labor rights. It means confronting the destructive effects of the empire of money. Um, that's why I think the, 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 the infusion of Confucianism, huh? into uh, modernization of China is important, especially using the lens of Fratelli Tutti number 118. In 100, no? though China has practices the spirit of the neighborliness, huh? yeah, of the Good Samaritan with the nations of the global South, China needs to overcome growing grass individualism within China and country China collaborate with. Huh? Uh, grass individualism is, yeah, is a history of the past, but I think it, it is also infiltrating you know, the Chinese society. So BRI has to also be on the lookout for this. 
less to its BRI development projects. This is infused into a more traditional communal society. No? So the bruis and the abandoned person on the roadside, I think should be looked and looked after and cared for in terms of like, you know, um, there are people who are excluded because of modernization. No? So I think there's a need to look after that, look after these bruised and wounded in the society, especially those excluded, no? because they shouldn't be a distraction from the modernization goal or from the China dream. And it, should be, it shouldn't be that. No? So therefore, there's a need to pay attention to, especially people who couldn't catch up, who are excluded by virtue of the fact that they are not digitally uh, literate. No? in that society, yeah. Uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, China is the world's top greenhouse gas emission. No? I mean, this is no secret, no? right after the US, no? And it's not absorbed from what Patrick Bartholomew called ecological sins. No? Why? Because uh, we too, you know, every nation has its share of degrading the integrity of the earth by causing changes in its climates by stripping the earth of its natural forest or destroying its wetland for human beings to contaminate the earth's water, its land, its air, and its life. For to commit a crime against the natural world is a sin against ourselves, a sin against God. Um, in China, the word has been used, uh, sin, sin refers to, you know, to, to God, uh, the God of the heavenly kingdom and also the earthly kingdom. No? Such anthropocentric actions have driven our planet. Sorry. <laughs> also, uh, not that this conversion and change of heart, I think that's so important. Huh? Um, and let, next slide, it's okay. Yeah, yeah the, the, the conversion and the trans, the change of heart, you know, we call this stage, you know, in the educational system, the, or the jargon of education or ethical education, we say it conversion or change of heart. The word transformation is also being used. Huh? We use the word transformative leadership, we use the word transformation, transformational education. Huh? To effect conditionist eco-ethics of inclusive harmony of heaven, earth, and the humans. No? So I think that that is also the Confucian's eco-ethics is important eh? in terms of bringing about conversion in China. No? and also through its BRI programs. So this enables people to effective pedagogy to grow in transcendence, solidarity, and responsibility and compassionate care of the poor and creation. So, and, and then influence all individual and community activity. So therefore, this China's common prosperity drive needs to dealing what Sorondo, Marcelo, and Ramanathan deem as the coupling of economic activities and wealth inequalities with environmental pollution and climate change, and therefore promote you know, a symmetrical new international relation that recognize what Matilda Nassau opinions no? as the ecological debt that the global north, including China, owes the global south for its disproportionate consumption of and consequent harm to natural and local cultural resources. No? So I think this kind of partnership, um, I call it a payback, uh, call it a pay forward. I think, yeah, this, this is important. No? This collaboration is forthcoming and it is important in terms of uh, you know, resolving no? the, the gap and, and then the ecological debt no? that we owe to countries of the South. No? I think also China can act as a counter hegemonic force to resist the lordship of global capitalism. Um, this is so widespread and prevalent, you know, and reverse the iron glad of the tyrannical and excessive anthropocentrism. That means, you know, the, 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 the humans are at the top of the chain, and therefore we command, we can financialize all kinds of resources. You know? Also to watch out for relativism, meaning to say that, you no. Know, uh, all goods, you know, all services, all the resources of the earth above or below ground are relative to us humans, you know, only good for our use. You know? Also excessive consumerism, the throwaway culture. 
I think in, in, in that BRI, in the achieving of the dream, uh, you know, for a shared prosperity for humankind, this, this kind of, this kind of, you know, um, this kind of isms have to be, uh, have to be on the watch out you know, so that BRI also guard, you know, the implementation process against all this. Huh? The wanton destruction of the earth, the global warming, climate change, the desertification of soil and extinction of species. You know? So I do hope that at COP27 and COP15, you know, we, do, uh, we do hope that DRI will also address you know, uh, the biodiversity collapse as well, uh, not just within China, but outside of China in terms of DRI. You know? Thank you. Next slide. Yeah. So I also think that China is supposed to promote an integral sustainable development that is more attentive to ethical principles, be it Confucianist or be it other you know, of the United Nations and related global agencies, which I think China is always quite, uh, quite keen to abide with. Huh? Pope Francis also enumerate you know, few principles that I think uh, BRI can take into account, which is more balanced levels of production, a better distribution of wealth, concern for the environment, the rights of future generations. All this need to be worked you know, within the BRI itself. Huh? Therefore, promoting an economy that favors productive diversity and business creativity. You know? Protection of the global commons like clean air, climate, and water in the campaign against world hunger and poverty. Huh? I think DRI is quite in sync huh, with some of these ethical principles. No? I think this is the last slide, no? Am I right? <laughs> okay. Ah, okay. Also, no, no. DRI has, uh, you know, has tried to promote uh, what we call solidarity no? across the nations in terms of shared prosperity. Yeah? Um, I think the two words in solidarity are quite important, solidity, no? that means expresses attachment to the good, the pursuit of the good, no? a striving for excellence and what is best for others, their growth in maturity and health, the cultivation of values and not simply material well-being. No? So that means there's a sense of transcendence, people are more than you know, their material well-being, their economic prosperity. No? There's also a sense in, called benevolence uh, in solidarity, which wills the good of others, a yearning for goodness and inclination towards all that is fine and excellent, a desire to fill the lives of others with what is beautiful, sublime, and edifying. I think, you know, the Confucianist ethics that talk about junzi, uh, junzi, um, I think that might be the metaphor that captured this, no? I mean, that's my own personal opinion. No? Finally, I, I think, you know, uh, it's, it's important to ensure the right of some to free enterprise or market freedom cannot supersede the rights of peoples and the dignity of the poor. Huh? Um, in other words, you know, the, 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 in, in China, we use the word ta zhong, huh? what's the lao bai xing, no? the people. Huh? Uh, they too have a right to sustainable development. No? They too have dignity. Huh? So respect for the natural environment also. Huh? For if we make something our own, it is only to administer it for the good of all, huh? for the good of everyone, everyone in China and those countries, for the good of everyone in the BRI countries. No? Okay, I think that's that's it. No? Uh, these are some of, yeah, some of the thoughts I would like to offer for, for continuous conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah.